Howdy. Welcome to Healthcare Ain't Easy with Chris Matthew. I'm Chris Matthew. Healthcare, AI, technology, it can be an amazing intersection. It can also be really daunting. Technology, healthcare, it can be really awe-inspiring. It can be terrifying. With AI now in particular, there can be more questions than there are answers. But what we're going to aim to do at Healthcare Ain't Easy is to be able to have some conversations around how we can incorporate technology into healthcare and how it can probably help better serve all of us. Not probably, I was gonna say probably serve <laughs> us. I think it can absolutely serve us, physicians, clinicians, patients, all of us. Um, I've spent the last two decades navigating healthcare in a variety of ways, uh, working with breakthrough technology, specifically right now with Sniffle. Uh, we are an AI-driven virtual care ecosystem. We have what we believe is extremely uh, exciting and, and real breakthrough technology for physicians and patients alike. Healthcare, it's not easy. It ain't easy. It's gonna, it is complicated and it's working. Um, we're gonna hear from my, my friend here, Amanda, in a moment, but some of her friends that say, healthcare is working exactly the way it was designed to work. That it, the people that have designed healthcare to work, it's working exactly the way they want it to work, which is confusing and really frustrating. But we're gonna to try to have conversations around how can we make healthcare better? How can we help people? How do we bring tech and advanced tech and AI to support people? So, and if this is your first time listening, <clears throat> uh, I'm a big believer in the why. My why is to connect with people so that we can boldly uh, contribute to an improved world. And I, I practice that why in my everyday life. If you are sharing your time with us, <clears throat> I genuinely want to know what your why is. If you'll <clears throat> follow us on our social channels, connect with us, I'm curious. What drives you? What's your purpose? What's your why? Um, I'm excited right now. <clears throat> what I'm excited about right now is that we are here in Austin. If you can't tell, that is the state capital. We are about to debut. We're making our national debut uh, with Sniffle. We're here at the Athena Thrive Conference, uh, Athena Health Thrive 2023. Today is the day that we, you know, open up the curtain and we fire the cannons and we bring the solution that we've been working on for years to the masses. And this is a, something I feel really grateful that I get to be a part of and I get to be on this team that, that has been working on this. Uh, there's 2,000 plus people that are going to be here and we are planning on being the bell of the ball. So if you're in Austin, if you happen to be uh, have some open time, come to the Austin Convention Center and genuinely, I hope that I get a chance to connect with you. Today, we have with us Amanda Brummett. I've been fortunate to know Amanda for several years now. Amanda is the, uh, the founder of the Brummett Group, which she founded in 2008 with a desire to deliver exceptional service to awesome clients while enjoying the areas she is the strongest, which are strategy, development, operations, and marketing. She specializes, she specializes in strategically planning growth and development for physician practices and infusion centers. Amanda loves nothing more than to geek out, <laughs> draw overstimulating spider maps on huge sheets of paper, and then deliver a beautiful organized strategic plan from the madness. She also enjoys uh, process improvement, grassroots marketing, negotiating, and customer service training. Over 20 years of healthcare industry experience in the areas of hospital administration, physician practice management, operations, physician recruitment, physician sales, marketing, corporate wellness, business planning, strategic development. She's done a lot. Um, Amanda is the former COO at, a, at Metropolitan Anesthesia Consultants and Anesthesia Practice in Dallas with over 85 anesthesiologists. She was previously the Director of Business Development and Physician Marketing uh, at Managed Care at Medical City Las Colinas in Irving. She has a bachelor's from Stephen F. Austin, holds a master's of health administration from the University of Southern California. She's a fellow of the American College Healthcare Executives. More importantly, she's a genuinely kind person. She takes the time to want to know people and connect with them. And I have felt that incredible kindness and I'm really happy that you're here. Thanks, Chris. I'm happy to be here. Welcome. <clears throat> so let's start with um, what's good. Well, you know, happy, happy morning. How's the, what's good in life? The weather is amazing. I, I live here in Austin and 
for the Dallasites that are listening, we run about 10 degrees warmer than you guys, and it really makes a difference in August and September. So just the beautiful weather. I mean, who doesn't love college football, cooking, opening the windows? Our, uh, the games didn't go the way we wanted for both of our teams this weekend, but it is the, all of that got wiped away because it was amazing. The one thing I always forget about is how much water there is in Austin. Like There's there is an opportunity to be in and around water all over the city. It's amazing. Yes, it is beautiful. Absolutely love it. It's part of what drew us here, but I do have to back up on football. My youngest is a junior at Texas Tech and they annihilated Baylor this <clears throat> weekend, which was very satisfying. Yeah. We have a couple <clears throat> colleagues uh, at Sniffle that are tech grads. <clears throat> Excuse me. They refer to it the har as the Harvard of the Plains. Yes, I did say that. That's for Harvard the two of, of you. Harvard of the Plains. Harvard of the Plains. That's their interpretation. Um, I, think, I think they really love Texas Tech. I don't know if we can go that far, but uh, <laughs> they were at the game this weekend, and they definitely had a big time. Nice. Uh, Amanda, can you give us a little bit of a highlight reel of where you're from and what was your experience like? What helped you? Sh what helped shape you to who you are today? Yeah, sure. Um, so originally from San Diego, which not a lot of people know, especially with this accent. Um, so born there, grew up mostly in East Texas, um, lived on 40 acres, had animals, got up at five o'clock in the morning to you know feed baby calves and things like that. I know how to build fence. Um, yeah, so also something a lot of people don't know. So um, very humble upbringing. It was really good for me, though. Uh, my parents worked hard. They taught me to work hard. Um, my dad often had three jobs at times to make ends meet. Uh, my mom worked, too. She's a nurse. So, um, yeah, it made me really, really tough and strong. Um, I was also kind of a weird kid. Um, I was super, super smart at a very young age and the town I grew up in was pretty small and they weren't really sure what to do with me. There were plenty of other smart kids too. Um, but we, we were a little bit of outliers. So, um, that was, that was unique. And my parents were really good about often reminding me someday you'll, you'll get out and you'll find your people. Um, and so I did, I, um, had my first job at 12 my first full-time job at 15, my first management job at 16. And yeah, while that sounds like maybe we have some child labor wow. issues going on, wow. it was great because by the time I got out of college, I had six years of management experience and was able to land a fabulous job. And it really um, kind of ricocheted my career. My uh, When I started at HCA, they hired me at a director level and literally on the first day of work when I sat down in the CEO's office, he looked at me and he's like, hey, I found out how old you are. I'm like, you did? <laughs> I said, yeah, it's fine as long as nobody else does. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> so my point in all that is um, having to work really hard when I was young was really, really good and just catapulted me. Um, when, okay, in that first role, when that CEO s said that, did, did you do things to try to make yourself appear older or? Uh, oh. You know? For sure. Yeah. I wore my glasses. I kept my hair up. I um, always either had on a collared shirt or a jacket. I wore, you know, three or four inch heels. I was 23, barely 23. Um, yeah. My first job uh, out of college uh, was in the physician recruiting area. Yeah. Arena. And mine was too. My first one. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, and so I go through training and they're like, you're going to be telling CEOs what to do. And I was like, <gasps> I can't, first of all, he's my elder. She's my elder. I can't tell them what to do. Right. My growing up, I'm like, I can't give them direction, directives. And they're like, yes, yes, you will. That's how this works. And I was like, okay. I shattered a few profiles and then it was like, it was go time. And I decided on the way there, I'm like, how are these people going to take a 23 year old seriously? Right. And, and I've got a plan of like 10 things that you must do for us to be successful. So my, I, I flipped this switch in my head and I was like, my name is Christopher. Christopher. And so there are people possibly throughout the state of New York that only know Christopher Matthew because <laughs> I was like, Christopher, I may have even deepened my voice. Um, <laughs> but I, as ridiculous as it was, it was like that flip in the head. I, when I became Christopher, I was like, no, this is what we're doing. And which sometimes, you know, a 60 plus year old hospital administrator is like, what are you talking about? I'm like, I'm here to win. Are you here to win? And they'd be like, okay, you're the expert. And I'm like, oh my gosh, <laughs> okay, that worked. No, you're Christopher. Of course that worked. Um, that's hilarious that that CEO said that to you. 
What, what town in East Texas? So technically not a town. Um, if you've ever been to Tyler State Park, we lived right outside of Red Springs, kind of in between Red Springs and Lindell. We had a Lindell address, okay. but not like trash pickup or anything like normal human right. beings have. Right. Yeah. Just fire pits. Yes. Um, we have family from Marshall. Oh, yeah. So right Lovely down the way. town. Great little hospital that actually has a good cafeteria. Wow. Yeah. We, I did physician recruiting for them. Shout out to the cafeteria folks in, in Marshall, <laughs> right. Texas. Right. Who ever heard of good hospital food? <clears throat> That's uh, okay. Let's, let's write that note down. <laughs> Amanda, um, wow, that is really interesting that you had that kind of experience that did allow you to catapult into management. That must have served you really well. So your your career has accelerated more than most twenty three year olds. Yeah, out, out of out of school. Sure. How did you choose healthcare? Or like what breakdown? Maybe why did you choose healthcare to be the place that you wanted to go plant your business? roots. Yeah. You know, on the surface, it was an accident in retrospect. Maybe it wasn't. Um, you know, as I said, my mom's a nurse, um, had lots of healthcare people in my family. So I went to business school, um, because I didn't know what I wanted to do. And the richest guy I knew had a marketing degree. So I went and got a marketing degree. <laughs> um, you know, I was, I, I graduated high school at barely 17. And so I just, I had to make decisions and who wants to make decisions when you're 17. So that's where I was headed. Um, when I got out of business school, I was pretty cocky, and I thought that the oracles of the world were going to come find me. I didn't go to any job fairs. They didn't have the internet back then. I thought I was going to get recruited at business school because I was so awesome. Um, nobody called. So um, as I started approaching graduation, and I, I was working two jobs. I mean, I was fine financially, but my pride wouldn't have been if I hadn't sure. gotten a big girl job. So. Um, started frantically looking for jobs um, and ended up finding a, a job with a, a small little um, distribution company, worked there for just a couple of months. There were crazy things going on there and I left. Um, but then I got, um, I saw an ad in the paper because that's how we got jobs back then <laughs> for a physician recruiting job in Athens, Texas and applied and fell in love with it. It was a great job. Um, got to work all over the state of Texas, including, you were never talking about some of the rural hospitals, the hospital here outside of um, Austin and Bastrop, <laughs> Smithville. Yeah. Yeah. Um, got to work there and just really enjoyed it. Um, it was such a good experience. I didn't know back then that, um, that there was a wide range of kinds of physician recruiters for the guests that don't know. It's kind of like being a chiropractor or personal injury attorney, there is a wide range of people that do it. And sometimes people assume that you're the kind of the slimy ones, or at yeah. least yeah. that was my no. experience. I, I, the industry definitely has that tainting over. All yeah, of it. for sure. That kind of company I worked for wasn't that way. Um, so I didn't know any better. So again, being a little prideful. Um, so worked there for two and a half years, first woman ever, only woman ever, birthed a child, brought said child to work with me because she couldn't get into daycare until she was six weeks old. Went back to work and she was two weeks old. There was no breastfeeding room or anything back then, but yeah. the guys were cool and shared the bathroom with me. Um, actually broke every company record they ever had for both retained contracts and contingency contracts was super fun because the guy I worked for wasn't exactly into like girl power. Um, but he loved the money that I made him. So he was super supportive of that. Wow. Um, and then after being there a little over two years, HCA was one of my clients, the hospital in Las Colinas. And uh, Anne-Marie Jaren there was leaving and she called me and asked if I had any interest in it. And um, I said, sure, why not? Went and interviewed, got the job, moved to Dallas and the rest was history. And wow. ended up spending five years with the company and, and just loved it. I've really found my passion there. I thought then I wanted to be a hospital CEO, so that's why I went to graduate school. And uh, one of my mentors said, since you went to Stephen F. Austin for undergrad, you need to do something a little bit more, you know, fancy for graduate school. So I went to USC, um, and and then yeah, ended up deciding to start my own company. So I didn't really need to go to graduate school, but that's okay. It's been helpful and gave me a really good college football team. <laughs> that's amazing. Um, so you're you're a record breaker. Record shatterer. Or at least I used to be. <laughs> I still think you are. Um, so that's, okay, so led to HCA. Then you got into an SVP role with Medical City. And then that led you to helping to lead a 
a group of physicians, eight, not just a group, 85 physicians. What's that transition like? And what's that experience like working with and, and being of service to physicians? Sure. Yeah. So kind of a common theme in my career. Um, I, so I'd actually started my company. I started my company in 2008, working in my pajamas before the rest of the world was working in their pajamas <laughs> from home, mind you. Um, Trendsetter. Right. Had two little kids at home and they could tell you about all the signs I've held up, like what I will give you if you keep your mouth shut till mommy's off the phone or what I will do to you if you don't. Some great parenting moments there. Um, so I was very happily doing my own thing. I think I had been at it for four years. And so I really hit my stride and things were going well. And Doug Welch called me. Doug was my first CEO at HCA. Great guy. And he says, hey, Amanda, I've got a medical group that is looking for somebody strong in operations, marketing, and physician recruitment. They're looking for a CEO, COO. Are you interested? And I said, well, Doug, wildly flattered that you called me, but no, I said, I'm literally sitting here in a tank top and sleepy pants and drinking my coffee and doing my remote work. And no, why, why would I want to get dressed every day and go to a real job? And he said, well, Hey, do me a favor. I said, sure. Anything. What do you need? He said, just go interview with them and then help them find somebody or point them in the right direction. I said, sure. No problem. So a couple of weeks later, I meet Dr. Norm Rice and Dr. Stephen Ellis, both amazing guys. And if you ever have to be put to sleep in the DFW area, <laughs> excellent options. Um, such a strange endorsement. It like, is. It's such a nice one. Too. I've turned into a real anesthesia <laughs> snob. That's a whole another show. Um, so met with them, loved them, but said, I'm, no, I'm, I don't want a real job. And I'm not, in, I'm not interested in a real job. They say to us, say to me, okay do this for us. We, we think you could work on a consulting basis. There's no way the rest of our board is going to go for that though. So come in, meet with the entire, they call them the management committee there, meet with the management committee and then, you know, throw we'll us a out. consulting something. Yeah. yeah, just do it. <clears throat> okay, sure. I go do that. It goes great. I really like them. They really like me. Seems like a really good fit. And somehow they ended up talking me into being their full-time in office. COO. There was no CEO or CFO, so you guys can figure out the dynamics there. I got to kind of do it all, which was fun. Um, yeah, so I did that for a little over a year, and then I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I really like working in my pajamas. I'm going to move back to a consulting role. Um, and their board was amazing. They actually came back to me and said, fine, will you maintain the position of our COO and just, you know, use a little bit of discretion, but Fine. So wow. I ended up, ended up staying there for five years, a year full time and another four just sort of in spirit showing up, you know, when we had meetings and things like sure. that, which was wild. Running a business and being a COO at the same time was super hard. I bet. The full time job was easier. And and raising girls and helping your husband's company and supporting all of just balance for your own life. That's a lot. Yeah. I'm pretty sure I didn't have to sleep back then. I was oh, younger. Okay. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> nice. That, that does make life easier. I haven't figured out how to exist without sleep. Yeah. Uh, not yet. But if there's an AI app out there for it, I'm here for it. So if, if you have one, send it my way. Yeah. Then you go from that to launching the Brummett Group. Yes. What was, was that always in the plans? Was that always part of the dream is I want to have my own shop doing this for practices everywhere? So I never wanted to own my own company. I am very risk averse. I like safety. I like known entities. Um, but there were some physicians that I'd worked with at HCA that actually encouraged me. They said, you need to go do this. And I'm like, thanks, but no. And then I had a, a series of life events. And um, I, I think it was God or the universe or whatever you know people believe in or don't believe in that sort of hit me over the head and said, you need to do this. It was one of those moments where have you ever been in like a room full of people and all of a sudden, you feel like you're the only person in the room and somebody's speaking directly to you. It was one of my professors at school, and it was as if he was talking directly to me and everybody else had left the room. And basically, he tells this story of how he was a single dad, but cared about his career, financially needed it, and did all of these different things to make sure all that happened, but then had this moment where he wanted to know his son. He didn't want to miss out on all that. And don't get me wrong, I was a great mom, but 
up until I got married, there were nannies and family and daycare involved. And it, you know, I dropped my daughter off before it got light out and I didn't pick her up until it was dark. And we had a really good time on the weekends, but I was all in yeah. on work. Um, so anyhow, as he's talking about this and I'm starting to think about some of my professors, again, USC was an amazing program. Like the guy that taught my managed care class was the sitting CEO of Blue Cross Blue Shield at the time. Like healthcare rock stars. Wow. And I start hearing a theme though, that these guys are all retired now or close to retiring, which is why they can spend the time to teach at SC. And they start talking about how they're getting to know their kids. And I'm like that, I don't want to be that person. So I, Brett and I were engaged, Brett's my husband at the time. I literally came home and said, Hey, I know I'm supposed to be the breadwinner and we're going to do all these great things with all this big money I'm earning, but how would you feel if I started a company? And I mean, Chris, you know, Brett, so you know what his answer was. For those of you that don't, he is the kindest, nicest human in the entire world. And he said, okay. And that was the end of it. Then I had, you know, 6,000 follow-up questions. Yeah. And that's it. That's, you just said yes. Yeah. And then he was, yeah, yeah. I said, yes. Yeah. He is one of the kindest people ever. He is. That is incredible. And so then you just did it. Yeah, so I did it. I um, left HCA. I took that first summer kind of off, which by the way, there are some humans in the world that are not designed to be um, stay-at-home moms. I'm one of them. The spices were organized. A beautiful dinner was on the table by 4.30 and I was pissed if everybody wasn't there and didn't deliver <laughs> excellent <laughs> metrics by the end of dinner. Um, yeah, I learned that about myself. So that was good to know that um, I, I I have to achieve and I'm going to do it one way or the other. Yeah. And it may not be fun for everybody right. else if it happens at home. <clears throat> um, so yeah, it started that and brought on a team, built it up. And actually when I worked at Metro, that was in between, which was super, super hard. Also a really good lesson for me professionally. For about a year, I ignored my team and they, they, were, they were smart and they were capable, but the only time in my career I can look back and I lost really great team members because I neglected them. They, they had needs, I didn't meet them as a leader and ultimately they left, which I do think was probably one of the catalysts that reminded me, wait a minute, no, my heart is doing my thing, not working for somebody else. Yeah. Um, so yeah, and then I've, I've been at it ever since. As a person that you are that is that loves to, uh, that is an active yoga practitioner, yes. finding balance <laughs> in life is a theme for you. Yes. Uh, I'm glad that you had that professor that could, and you had that moment to be able to realize I don't want to wait until I'm in my 60s to get to know my kids. Right. It's hard to do that actively and while building something. Um, my, my wife and I, we definitely, a lot of grace is given to us. Uh, we do our best. Our, both of our boys, they're, they're on four sports teams right now. Oh, my goodness. I'm somehow coaching two of them. <laughs> what? Why? I've told the universe, I'm done saying yes to things. And then, I, then they... They ask and I say yes, oh. but it's also so fun and it makes the weeks crazy. It makes Saturdays bananas, right? <laughs> Saturdays are nuts, yes. but do you divide and conquer? We do. We have to, unfortunately, yeah. and which is also a downside because I don't get to be there for the other boys games, but, um, it is a lot, but my wife and I remind ourselves and we say this to our boys all the time. You can do hard things. We can do hard things. So yeah. let's do this and let's be active and be present. And I think that's, it's important to us. It sounds like it's something that's important to you all too. Yeah, for sure. And um, not that you asked for advice, but you will get through I'm, it. I'm here for you it. You will get to the other side of it. And I, I have to say now that my daughters are, they're about to be 21 and 23, both amazing young women. Um, I used to tell them all the time when they were that age, you know, I'm not trying to be your friend today. I'm trying to be your friend when you're 30 and it happens. You get there. I mean, they're not 30 yet, but they, they made it through all of that stuff. And it's funny now that they're getting a little bit more introspective and reflective, they, they talk about those memories, those things, all that time that you and your wife are putting in. They don't remember the stuff we bought them. They don't remember, you know, the, the fancy things. It's the, I remember that you took me to this, that you did this with me. The experiences. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm glad you bring up the experiences. So <clears throat> I want to talk about what, in your experience of healthcare, and you've seen lots of things, what are you most optimistic about for healthcare? There's, listen, there's lots of reasons to be frustrated with healthcare. There's lots of, there's a myriad of reasons to be really annoyed and frustrated and, and even mad at healthcare. Yeah. 
let's put those to the side. What are you optimistic about when you think about healthcare today and where it could be going? What, what brings you excitement? I'm going to say two things, and they're on opposite spectrums. Uh, the first is just on the access side. I, I truly believe that with some limitations on it, that we are all entitled to at least pursue health. Um, some of us did not hit the genetic lottery, and that stinks. But I think that we all need access to good health care. Um, I do put some caveats on there. You know, if you're having a burger and a cigarette and a beer, you know, three, meals, three meals a day, right. I, I get less worried about advocating for your access to really great health care. Right. But even still, those people deserve really good health care, too. Um, I think that things are getting less expensive, even though it feels like they're getting more expensive. If you think about basic primary care and basic needs, they're getting less expensive. As drugs have been on the market longer, they're getting more accessible. And so there is, there's part of me that sees the basic health care is, is getting more accessible and is going to be more accessible. We still need to do better. We've still got a long ways to go. But I personally see it getting better. And that is exciting for me because I, I think we all need good health care. And then on the totally opposite end of the spectrum, specialized precision type medicine has me really, really excited, um, both from a personal and a professional aspect. For instance, like I did 23andMe a long time ago, and yes, Big Pharma is probably selling my data, but I am hopeful that when I'm 70, if I have some kind of ailment that they've sold my data to the right company that has created a drug that can hopefully help me. And I think that with genetic testing and some of the things that, that we've God, and, and even some of the AI and the predictive analytics that can tell me maybe what might be happening sooner. I see a world, maybe maybe in our generation, but definitely in your boys and my daughter's future when they're older, where you can have a very personalized regimen so that maybe you don't have to take six different drugs that only worked a little bit. Maybe you get to take just one drug that worked really well, because I don't care about having a long life. I care about thriving. I'd rather live a short life and be really healthy and then just go out. And so I think that that could happen. I do worry that that's all going to be very expensive. Yeah. But the longer it's around, maybe the less expensive it gets. And the more AI they can use in it, that's helping the price. Absolutely. Um, AI, advanced tech can do so much that it's, again, th there's this interesting conversation like, oh, AI and tech is going to replace people. No, it's just a tool mm -hmm. to come alongside people. It's um, people will become craftsmen with AI and with advanced tech. And yes, that means they have to upskill. And yes, that means people have to get more sophisticated. But it's uh, my reference to AI and healthcare is the first time the stethoscope, stethoscope was presented, people had to be skeptical. Oh, for sure. The first lab test, I, oh, I know what's going on inside of you because I, I put these solutions together and I can tell you with precision what's that no that's ridiculous people were skeptical the first imaging machine you're gonna wand me and tell me what's happening inside my body what are you crazy right <laughs> but now stethoscopes lab tests imaging this is all just like standard extension of physicians yeah ai is is just that it's just really early it's really new so that leads me to my next question when you were guiding and advising physicians and you are doing that now still yeah. with the brummett group um, how adverse or open are physicians and clinicians to welcoming AI and advanced technologies into their practice? I think it depends on the physician. You know, we've got physicians, our, our baby doctors fresh out of residency or what, 29, 30. I think they're pretty <laughs> open to it, very comfortable with it. I mean, they're a lot younger than me. They grew up with a device in their hands. I think you've got people that are headed out of practice that are still intimidated by it. But also you can't make generalizations about people because you know the 70 year old is this, 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 the super user on the EMR isn't uncommon either. So I think it's very dependent on the person, their environment and the culture of the organization that they're in. You know, if they're in an organization that's very tech friendly, the tech is well thought out and works when they roll it out. I think that any physician if you can show them the benefit to their patients and that it's not going to take more staff time or more of their time, they're open to it. I do think 
as an industry, we've had a lot of tech products that were probably rolled out too early or overpromised or underdelivered. But mm-hmm. and that scares doctors because they've all bought some technology that stunk and then they had to reverse that and they spent money and time on it. But I think as technologies get better and particularly ones that actually work well and improve their lives, I I think that they're open to embrace it. Yeah. One of our board of directors, Rachel Wallace, she's the CEO of HealthStar Physicians uh, Mm -hmm. of Hot Springs. She talks about this uh, and she said physicians have, it's a real thing. Change fatigue is a real thing. Click Mm -hmm. fatigue is a real thing because they're open to it. Like you say, but then they expect, they have an expectation for it to work. Just like the patient expects the doctor to know what is going on. Yeah. It's not like, oh, doc, it's okay. You can get this wrong a couple of times. That's not the patient's expectation. So the physician also has an expectation of all things in their ecosystem. It needs to be accurate. It needs to be working. And I need to, it, it cannot slow me down. Yeah. It needs to make their life better. Better. It has to allow them better care. <clears throat> so we met through your husband. Mm-hmm. Uh, Brett Brummett, who's the owner of Generous Benefits, great group. Um, we've had the chance to work with each other a couple of times over the last several years. You, of course, know my very biased view on virtual care, <laughs> but I am curious around the business models that exist out there where physicians are getting 20 bucks for a visit. Is that business model, does that take care of doctors? Does that support clinicians in the long game? So... No, the answer short and short, no. Physicians have to be compensated well enough that they can literally afford to do what they're doing. They've got to be able to afford some minimal overhead, malpractice. A lot of them come out with, you know, as much as half a million dollars in student loans. So we have to make it financially viable to them. At 20, to, in my opinion, as a consultant, at $20 a visit, that's not worth the liability that that doctor takes in the event that they get sued. Right. I do think that they can absolutely utilize technology to make their visits more efficient, give them more information up front, help them to speed things along. It it is faster for me to turn on a screen and run through a bunch of visits than it is for me to physically go from room to room. Um, So I do think it has the ability to help fix some of the compensation issues and make them more viable. Right. Um, Part of that comment you you made there, $20 $20 isn't worth a physician's liability. But then when you think about the current business models that are in place for telehealth, which we don't really like that term, uh, we prefer virtual care at Sniffle, but to make any money, then unfortunately you have to have an incredible velocity of patients. Yeah. So now your risk is actually going up because you're just flying through consults because to make any actual money, you need to be able to see 40, 50, 60 patients a day I don't think anyone could could make a case to say that that's really quality driven healthcare. Oh, I totally agree. And I think it it depends on what you're seeing somebody for. Is Agreed. this an annual physical? Is this, you know, my head is my eye is leaking blood and I have pressure in my head or is this classic strep throat? Agreed. Some of those things you can diagnose in 2 minutes. Yeah. Some it needs a 20 minute visit. Um, let me ask you this question because you advise private practices all, all around the country for those people, those physicians that are considering wanting to get into private practice versus go to work for a hospital or system. What advice would you give to someone that says, I want to be in charge of my medical career. Yeah. I want to con- consider jumping into private practice, but it seems that the whole deck is stacked against me. The medical complex is so complicated. Sure. What advice would we give to those physicians? So I think it depends on their specialty. Um, If they're primary care, I'm going to encourage they consider DPC, which I'll come back to in a second. If they are anything but primary care, I would encourage them to set up something that operationally is reasonable. Um, Don't overspend. I think a lot of people get very excited in the beginning, especially if they have a loan or some investments. You don't need a fancy office Um, You need a a nice office. It needs to be immaculately clean, but it doesn't have to be fancy. Um, Utilize technology. The less staff, staff is huge. It's expensive though. So the less staff they can have, the better. So having online scheduling and really good technology to help push processes through without a human being are really important. 
And then the last thing I would tell them is, and then this is crazy that I have to say this out loud, but at every touch point, the humans they interact with have to be really, really kind from, I hope I don't have to call to schedule, but if I have to call to schedule the person scheduling, the nurse or MA that does my intake, the physician I see, the person at the billing department, because particularly in competitive markets, people have choices. Mm -hmm. And if you aren't nice to them, they will go elsewhere. Now, maybe not if you're some super specialized neurosurgeon or pediatric subspecialist, but if you're an internist or an orthopedist, you've got to be great to people. <clears throat> and I truly believe that if you do a really good job with all of that, your practice will sustain itself. Your patients will tell each other and the business will come. Yeah. Do you need some marketing up front? Absolutely. But if you do it all really, really well, I don't know that you need marketing five years later. Yeah. <clears throat> if you do need marketing, the Brummett Group is always <laughs> available for you. Uh, you mentioned uh, three letters that I don't know everyone knows. DPC. Sure. So DPC, direct primary care. So I see people use DPC for, well, let me tell you what DPC is, and then I'll tell you why I see people use it. Um, it is literally where you pay a membership fee to see a primary care doctor. People use it both with and without insurance. Um, the two ways that I see people or reasons why I see people accessing it is one, they can't afford traditional insurance and deductibles and co-pays. Um, so those people are very drawn to DPC. Um, the other, and actually I fall into this category, I, my husband literally owns an insurance brokerage. We have as much good insurance as is commercially available, but I want that really good access. And with the DPC, you can text your doctor, you can call your doctor anytime, all the time. A doctor's visit isn't two minutes long. It might be 20 minutes or your initial intake is usually like an hour and a half. So I think it's great for the patient. It's mm -hmm. kind of getting back to old primary care when your doctor knew you and they knew that if Chris calls and says he's got, you know, a little bit of a cold, that Chris is tough. And if Chris says he has a cold, then maybe he actually has something really bad like the flu because Chris doesn't call and say he has a cold or maybe the opposite. Maybe if Chris calls and says he has a cold, it's just allergies. And we know this about Chris and we're going to ask some questions and move on. But I think it's really, really good for the patients. But the reason I say I'd recommend it to the practitioner if they're family medicine or internal medicine is as I see the direct primary care doctors and the way they look at the end of the day, they're happy. They are back to practicing medicine the way they wanted to. I think that's amazing. I think um, all people deserve to have joy in their lives. Mm -hmm. But if people can find joy in their, in their work and purpose in their work and it can fill their cup, like, what an amazing place to be. And physicians deserve that. Clinicians deserve that. And, and we want that for them for, as patients. Yeah. Because physician burnout is a very real thing. I, I spoke with uh, Dr. Jeff Kerr, a chief medical officer uh -huh. at Baylor Scott & White. And he was telling us that during the pandemic, the rate of retirement was 5 to 10x during that two-year period than normal periods of time we're losing physicians because they're burning out and, mm -hmm. and the joy of medicine is escaping. Mm -hmm. It's not within their reach. And so as patients, that's, we, we need to care about this because if they're not here to care for us, then, and, and listen, as much as I love AI, and I think that AI can do an incredible amount of us for us in healthcare and that patients should be able to rely on a mobile first encounter. Mm -hmm. Totally agree that doesn't circumvent the fact that we need physicians and we need clinicians and we need people that can be enthusiastic and passionate about their work. And if we don't find a way to collaborate together, patients gotta have a hand in this too. Technology and, and the ecosystem has to have a hand in this and physicians have to have a hand in this and a strong voice to be able to speak up and say, enough is enough, right? Big insurance, you gotta stop. This thing that came out last week with UHC saying, Hey, to control the cost of healthcare, uh, docs, you're going to need to take a pay cut. What? These people made 12% and I'm off right. more profit than they've ever made in Q1 this year. And I'm for companies growing and being profitable because with that, they can do good deeds. Yeah. However, to squeeze the clinical community seems like the very wrong thing to do. Absolutely. And you bring back to your original question was if people are deciding, do they want to go to work for like a health system or do they want to go into private practice? And you didn't say these words, but you almost led to that. It's a little daunting to consider private practice. Yeah. That is a great example of why they need to. I personally have 
a ton of friends that in the last three weeks got laid off in the UHC, Optum, WellMed layoffs, both physicians, nurse practitioners, PAs, and non-clinicians. And the reality is, is if you go to work for somebody else, anybody, not, not just UHC, you don't hold your future in your own hands. So you can have a great job and, and you get laid off. Yeah. Clinicians deserve more. Patients deserve more. We, we all deserve uh, to be able to be happy and healthy. And, Absolutely. Um, I know that you and your team at the Brummett Group are making that contribution to that ecosystem. And I love that. My final question for you. Chris Shembra is a Wall Street Journal bestselling author, and he has this great book called Gratitude and Pasta. Uh-huh. Uh, and it's about, he creates these dining experiences, um, like you were talking about earlier with your kids, experiences are what people really latch onto and they remember long-term. Yeah. And he asked this question during the dinner and everyone at the table takes their turn of, of answering it. If you could give credit or thanks to one person in your life that you don't give enough credit or thanks to, who would that be? Okay. I have three. Okay. I'll make them fast. They're, they're all professional because I think I do a good job in my personal life of being verbally affectionate and saying thank you for things. Um, so first is Doug Welch. I actually mentioned him earlier. He's my first CEO at HCA. And the reason I say Doug is he was such a good mentor and leader and he made me make my own decisions and gave me permission to fail. So if I would come in his office, lay out a scenario, he would not give me the answers. We could talk through options. And then at the end of the conversation, he wouldn't tell me what to do, but he would say, come back in two days or three days. Let me know how it worked out. If you failed, what are you going to do different next time? Beautiful gift to give a young executive permission to fail. Totally. Amazing. Right? My partner, Rich, we, we have a saying in our company, if we give you the responsibility, we're also going to give you the authority. Yes. And you can't have the responsibility without the authority. The authority is yours. The decision is yours. I'm here to be an advisor. Yes. But you make the call because we trust you to make that call. Right. Yes. The second is Britt Barrett. He was the CEO of Medical City Dallas. I worked for him for a little while. And as I would walk the campus with him, I observed that Britt, and that's a huge campus, yeah. Britt knew every single person from the pediatric kidney transplant doctor to the lady doing the trash. And he knew them, knew them well. He knew the lady doing the trash, the janitor. He knew who her kids were. He knew she worked three jobs and that she had two kids going to college cash that she was paying for. And so as I worked with Britt, I learned that truly getting to know people across the spectrum was a great way to, one, as a leader, get people to follow you. But genuinely, he didn't, it wasn't manipulative. He genuinely cared. And those people would follow Britt anywhere. And then I even experienced it later on, two years later, I hadn't worked with him in years. I'm at ACHE Congress in Chicago. There's probably two or 3,000 people there. Massive, massive room. And he's one of the speakers there. He's kind of, not kind of, he's a big deal in the healthcare world. I see him across the room. And I wave because, you know, I'm from East Texas. You make eye contact with another human. You, Howdy. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And he waved back and then does this. And I'm like, I'm looking behind me because surely Britt Barrett's not talking to me. I don't even know if he remembers me. And it was like he parted the Red Sea for me to come over and then introduces every, me to everybody he's with. And it was the first time, you know, we, we all heard, you never remember what people said, but you remember the way they made you feel. All of a sudden, I got to be on the receiving end of that and thought, I have to learn to emulate. I have to be like Brit one of these days. I'm still working on that part. That's amazing. The third one is Dr. Norm Rice. He was the chairman of the board for part of the time that I was running Metro Anesthesia. And we definitely had that, that physician executive dyad thing going on. Um, it was great because you know he could be the clinician. I could be the financial person. But the thing that I learned from Dr. Rice was no matter what, you unequivocally take care of your team. There was no mistake that we ever made behind the scenes that publicly he didn't own. And, and don't get me wrong, Dr. Rice would let you know what you had done wrong behind closed doors, but in a boardroom, he had your back 100% of the time. And that unequivocal trust made me go to links that I would have maybe been apprehensive with less of a leader. And so all three of them taught me really good lessons. And the reason I think of them when you get back to your gratitude thing is I don't know that I've ever verbalized to any of them 
how much I appreciate what they did for me professionally. So I'll go home and do that. <laughs> I think that is going to make their day, their week, their month. Um, and I'm, I would, uh, I'm making an assumption. I try not to make assumptions, but I bet you're not the only person that they've made that impact felt to, right? For and sure. So what a testament to those three gentlemen to do that and to have such big roles, but still find a way to create uh, space for kindness and, and empathy and real connection with people. That's amazing. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. Um, Amanda, thank you so much for being here today. Yeah, it's been my pleasure. Always good to talk to it's you, Chris. Wonderful to talk to you. Give my best to Brett. Um, and I want some coffee next time. I can make that happen. Yeah, I love it. Uh, this is Healthcare Ain't Easy. We are here trying to find ways to talk about how healthcare and AI can help physicians, can help patients. Um, healthcare ain't easy. But if we collaborate, if we connect, if we communicate, and we start talking through this, we can find ways to create better care in a bigger picture. Appreciate your time. Talk to you soon.